words of the Lord's, uh, of the Apostles' Creed, and then immediately we will also recite the Lord's Prayer. So let's recite the Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the Lord is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you have your Bible with you this morning, please turn, if you would, with me to the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is God's word. We know that the Lord will add his blessing to his word as he has promised for his name's sake. Let's just unite our hearts again in prayer as we talk to God's word this morning. Our gracious Father, again, we pray that you will calm and control our hearts and our minds. Bring us again to that posture of sitting silently and expectantly like Mary at the feet of Jesus, to hear his word. Open our understanding to grasp it, open our hearts to receive it. Think of the words of the inspired writer who said that we are to receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save our souls. And so, Lord, again, we ask that thou will be gracious to us. Close us now into yourself, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us over the last number of weeks, and most of you have, uh, you will know that we have been engaged in a series of studies pursuing the topic of gospel pictures in the Old Testament. And I suppose that the question might arise, why this constant emphasis on the gospel? Are there not other subjects that we could talk about? Uh, could we not talk about war and famine and culture and ideology and all of that? Are there not other things even in the Bible? There are many, many things in the Bible. But I think the answer to the question why the constant emphasis upon the gospel is, 
is evident from the scripture itself. Because the gospel is the primary message of the Bible. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of the inspired word. We thought last week of the fact that the Holy Spirit, according to the Lord Jesus, would be sent into this world with this express purpose. Jesus said, he will glorify me. And he will take of mine and he will show it unto you. It is the Spirit of God's sacred duty and I believe his sacred delight to reveal to men and women the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the evidence of that is in the Bible itself. Remember that it is the Holy Spirit who inspired the Scriptures. This is not a collection of the thoughts and philosophies of men that have been gathered together. Holy men of God, we are told by the inspired writers, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And therefore, we've only got to look at the Scripture to see that it is the Holy Spirit's burden, if I could use that terminology concerning Him, to reveal to us the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the hero of the entire story. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, made this statement, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. That's a solemn thought for any preacher. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I've often thought those words should be inscribed in front of the pastor every time he comes up into the pulpit. To remind him again of his solemn calling and responsibility. As Paul said of himself, I determined not to know anything among you, said Jesus Christ and, and him crucified. Paul further declared that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And the English scholars tell us that that particular way of phrasing by the Apostle Paul is, is what they call in the English grammar litotes. I hope I pronounced that right. L-I-T-O-T-E-S. It's a kind of a deliberate understatement. It's emphasizing something by negativing the opposite of it. For example, if I were to say to you that Calgary is not a small city, you would immediately recognize what I'm trying to say, that Calgary is a great city, it's a big city, it's a populated city. And so you, you make the emphasis by putting the negative on the opposite. It's not small, it means it's big. And so when Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he's really saying this, far from being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, I'm the very opposite. I glory in the gospel of Christ. I boast in the gospel of Christ. You remember how he said in his letter to the Galatians, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this word boast is one of which Paul is constantly, uh, co constantly delighting to use. And his glory is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question is why? The verse that I'm quoting from, Romans 1, 16 and 17, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then he says, for, here's the reason. Or we could say because. He says, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is not only primary in scripture, the gospel is the power of God. And I, and I have to ask myself, has the church some way or another lost its confidence in the power of the gospel. If it has, then please explain to me why there are so many sections even of evangelicalism that feel it is necessary to somehow complement or supplement the gospel with something else. Or to add to it something of the novelties and gimmicks of men. No, the gospel is the power of God. It's the power of God unto salvation. And Paul repeats that same essential truth in 1 Corinthians 1.18 when he says the, the message of the cross or the word of the cross or as it, as it is in the old KJV, the preaching of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but unto us who are being saved it is the power of God. You notice, beloved, this morning in those two texts, Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 1, he does not simply say the gospel is about the power of God. 
No, he actually says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And that expression is used by Paul, the power of God, he only uses on one other occasion or in one other instance, and that is to refer to Jesus Christ himself. Because he says Christ is the wisdom of God and Christ is the power of God. And so we have this gospel, this gospel that Paul proclaims, this apostolic gospel, which he declares is the gospel of Christ, and he says it is the power of God unto salvation. And then, notice also that the gospel is not only the primary message of the Bible, and not only is the gospel of the power of God, but precisely because it is the power of God, it is productive. It is effective. It works. It works in the hearts and souls of men and women. And that's why I, I read to you from the latter part of Isaiah chapter 55, where the Lord talks about his word that goes forth out of his mouth. And he says, it will not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please or I purpose, and it shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And if you notice the immediate context of the chapter when he talks about the word going forth out of his mouth, what is that word? Well, the chapter begins with the great gospel invitation, doesn't it? Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. He that has no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And in verse 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Is not that gospel? Is not that the word that is going forth out of God's mouth? And it is this word that God says is productive. It will not return to him empty. It will accomplish that which he purposes and succeed in the thing whereto he ascended. Friends, this morning I say all that to you not by way of apology, but by way of explanation. May this church always be a church that is known as a gospel church. That from the pulpit, Sunday by Sunday, that men and women will hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That they will hear the gospel of the grace of God. And this is why we major on it. It is, in the words of Paul, as he defines the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, as of first importance. There's nothing more important than this. And I say that is true not only for the unbeliever, the unbeliever clearly needs to hear the gospel, but it is also true of the believer as well. Somehow or another we have bought in as Christians to this idea that when you preach the gospel to the lost, and God in his grace and his spirit is pleased to use it to bring them to Christ, then you shelve it. And you start to preach something else. Nothing could be more detrimental to the spiritual well-being of people than to believe that lie and the lie it is. You see, if you look at Romans 1, 16 again, and I, I am, I'm digressing here a little bit this morning, but allow me a little latitude, if you will. If you look at Romans 1, 16, he says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. And I'd like to point this out. I've told you before, but it's important. He does not simply say that the gospel is the power of God unto conversion. It is that, of course. But he uses the word salvation. Salvation is a much broader word, isn't it? It involves not only that moment when we first believe, but it involves the entire work of God in our hearts and lives. It involves justification, sanctification, glorification, and the power of God in our sanctification, which is that sacred process whereby in every one of us he's making us more and more like Jesus. What is the power of God that affects that? Paul says it's the gospel. How many think it's the law? How many think it's, it, it, it's, it, it's telling people the do's and the don'ts and so on? I, I understand the law is God's law and the law is good and so on. But do you know what the, the purpose of the law is according to the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians? He says the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. In other words, it's the pedagogue, that's the Greek word. And a Greek pedagogue was one employed by a parent, 
uh, who would undertake the education of their child. And the pedagogue would take the hand of the little one and lead them to the classroom and teach them. And the very purpose of the law of God is to, is to lead us to Jesus Christ. To show us the necessity of him. That he and he alone and his grace and power are what we need. Not just for the moment of conversion but for every day of our lives until we see the Lord face to face. It is power to do this on its own. It does not need, as I've said, to be supplemented, much less to be replaced by the wisdom of men or the novelties and gimmicks of the world. The word that spoke life and light into existence at the very beginning is still effectual to bring the light of the gospel and the life of God into darkened and dead sinners' hearts. That is why we major in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have seen that the Holy Spirit, as we've already indicated, has been pleased to place this gospel everywhere in the scriptures. And even here, in the passage that we read together this morning from Genesis chapter 3, we see it again. We see it here at the gates of Eden. And the story is well known, I'm sure, by all of you. Adam and Eve, our first parents, placed in the beautiful garden of abundance and delight, fell into sin, disobeyed the commandment of God. And after the fall, there came inevitably fear, as Adam confesses to God, I was afraid. And because of the fear after the fall, there became the flight. And they sought to run and to hide from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the story doesn't end there. God intervenes. And God intervenes in grace. And once again we have to give unto us a beautiful picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ right here in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. And I want to look with it under five headings this morning and say, well, your points numbers are increasing. We've gone from three to four. Now we're going to five. <laughs> Sounding more like a pure up sermon every Sunday. But don't worry, we'll try to put a little less under each point. Five words, all alliterated again, of course. And uh, the first one is initiative. Uh, who takes the initiative in this whole process with regard to the salvation of our fallen first parents. God himself does. Initiative, that's the first word. The second word is investigation. As God comes to Adam and Eve, shivering there in fear among the trees of the garden, trying unsuccessfully, I would suspect, to conceal their nakedness recently discovered by sewing fig leaves or aprons or loincloths, depending on the translation that you use. And God comes and he investigates with a question and he says, Adam, where are you? The third word is invitation. Because in asking the question, the investigatory question, God is inviting the confession of his fallen creatures. And thirdly, in, or fourthly, intention. What is God's intention in doing all that he does here and saying all that he says here? What does he desire? What's behind his activity on this particular occasion? What is in his heart as he comes to his rebellious creatures? And finally, implementation. How God exactly provides in his grace the very salvation which they needed. So those are the five Initiative, investigation, invitation, intention, and implementation. Initiative, when our first parents fell and when sin uh, had its consequence, when their failure had its consequence in, in fleeing to hide in fear, God did not sit still. And God was not silent. And most wonderful of all, God did not shun them. 
Isn't that interesting? He descends to where they are. He came, as it were, right into the garden, right to the very scene of the crime, if I could put it that way. And he pursued after them. And isn't this one glorious aspect of the grace of our God, that the grace of God is always first? That it is always God who takes the initiative? It doesn't begin in our hearts. You see, when we sin as we do, and when we become aware of our sin as we do, our natural instinctive is not to run to God, but to do what Adam and Eve did, to run from God. And indeed, to try, unsuccessful and foolish and futile as it is, to try and hide from the very presence of the Lord. Man left to himself, brethren and sisters, today will never seek after the Lord. God must first begin by seeking after him. You know, you think of the stories in Luke 15, the well-known parables of the lost sheep and silver and sun. You think of the lost sheep, just to take the first one, for instance, the sheep did not seek after the shepherd. The shepherd went after the sheep. And isn't it wonderful that God begins with us, begins and takes the initiative always in his work of grace? In our own hearts, God did that with you and I who are believers. It all began with him. The initiative was always his. Man will always rebel. Man will always resist. Man will always refuse. Man will always run. And so God must first begin in his grace to come to him. As I was thinking over this yesterday, and I thought of Ephesians chapter 2, you know, where Paul begins by describing the unconverted state of those who were now believers in Ephesus. He, he reminds them that they were dead in trespasses and sins. He reminded them that they walked according to the course of this world. He reminded them that they, they lived in the desires and fulfilled the lusts of the flesh. And they were by nature children of wrath, even as others. What a somber, what a sober picture. And if that was all that was to be said, what hope there, would there be? But then there's these two glorious words at the beginning of Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But God. <laughs> but God. How... how Utterly hopeless would man's state be, as is thus described by the Apostle Paul, but, but for those two words, but God. You and I were dead in our sins. You and I were living according to the flesh. You and I were fulfilling the desires of the flesh. We were by nature children of wrath, even as others. And that is a somber and a very frightening statement, children of wrath. Hopeless and helpless, designed for the judgment and for the condemnation and for the wrath of God. But, but God, God did something. But God, he says, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin. It all began with him and his grace and in his kindness. You have this powerfully powerfully illustrated in the conversion of Saul and Tar of Tarsus. He's breathing out, begins Acts chapter 9, he's breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He's obsessed with a, a, a bitter hatred against Christ, against his gospel, against his people. He's on the very road to Damascus with one express purpose. He's going to lay his hands upon every Christian he can find and bring them in chains to Jerusalem. And then God did something. <laughs> Unexpectedly. I don't think Saul could ever have anticipated what was going to happen on that dusty road to Damascus. <clears throat> with the light shone above the brightness of the sun and the voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Was Saul seeking the Lord? Not at all. God jumped into his life. God ambushed him on the road to Damascus. And it always is the same, brothers and sisters. It began with God. Before thy hands had made thy son to rule the day, our earth's foundations laid, our fashioned Adam's clay. What thoughts of grace 
and mercy flowed in thy great heart of love, O God. The initiative. And secondly, the investigation. As God comes, taking the initiative, as he comes down into the, into the garden, to the scene of the crime, to the very place where now our fallen first parents are seeking to hide from his presence, he comes with a question. God's first words to the first sinner, and they are these. Where are you? Where are you? Now, of course, we need to, we need to say that uh, God doesn't ask questions of us because he needs the information that he doesn't have. God's omniscient, he is all-knowing. There's a sense in which we could say that this is a rhetorical question, but there's, there's more to it than that. You see, when God asks a question, and when Jesus Christ in the death of his flesh, he asked questions, it was not because he didn't know the answer, but it was rather that the people to whom he addressed the question would ask, themselves the question, would direct the question to their own hearts. And so it was here when he comes to Adam, he's saying, Adam, consider this, where are you? Where are you? Well, we, use it, we use that kind of expression even in uh, ordinary everyday speech. I was listening to Dr. Uh, Alistair Begg talk about this and he says there's an expression he's heard from people and they'll say to somebody else, where are you in your head? It's kind of a funny way to put it. <coughs> but we talk about where a person's at in terms of maybe a progressing illness or something like that. Or we're talking about uh, where, what they're thinking about. Where are you, where are you at? Where, where are you? And perhaps there is no greater question, since it was God's first question to the first sinner that every person should ask themselves, where am I? Where, where, where am I at? Where, where am I in relation to God? There's a, good, there's a good question. Am I walking in fellowship with the Lord? Do I walk beneath the smile of his acceptance and approval? You know, that, that very thought must have must have entered the heart of, of Adam and Eve. For they did once walk with God. They did once enjoy his fellowship. They did once commune with him in the garden in the cool of the day as he came down because his delights were with the sons of men as we read in the book of, of, the book of Job. But where are you now? It's not the case now, Adam, is it? You're not running out to meet with me with expectancy and anticipation and, and joy in my fellowship. No, on the contrary, you're running from me. You're hiding from me. And so that may be said, too, to the unconverted soul. Where are you in relation to God? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you living your life beneath the smile of his acceptance and approval? You see how penetrating the question is, where, where, where are you? Where are you not only in relation to God, but where are you in relation to eternity? You know, the, the, the quirk, or one of the quirks of our, of our fallen nature, one of the quirks of our darkened understanding, which is the, the fruit and the result of our sinfulness, <coughs> is that we tend to live Although theoretically we give assent to the reality that we're not here to stay, that we're, we're going on and we're going to die, it's appointed unto man once to die, but we live as if we had eternity to live. But isn't it a sobering thought to ask ourselves, where are we in relation to eternity? The answer to that question for all of us is we don't know. Because we don't know what a day may bring forth. And we're told that we're not to boast ourselves of tomorrow precisely for that reason. Our hearts could stop beating today. The breath could leave our lungs. Our spirit could take its flight into eternity and never to return. And therefore it's a solemn question when we say, where are you? Where are you in relation to what you were created to be? Because man was not created for damnation. God never made a man or woman to damn them. 
Where are you in relation to what you were created to enjoy? Is your life one of freedom and fellowship and fullness? Or is the terror of God causing you to hide? His guilt and shame causing you to immerse your thoughts, your soul, your energy in things of time and sense? How many there are today who have, and they will actually say it to you if you try to, if you try to talk to them about their soul and about the gospel, they'll actually use this, but these very words, I have no time for that. Plenty of time for pleasure, plenty of time for business, plenty of time for relationships. And in those things of the earth, those things of time and sense, they immerse themselves. They are like the trees of the garden in which they try to hide from the presence of the Lord God. <coughs> but thirdly, in his investigation, God, the Lord, is by implication giving an invitation. He's giving them an opportunity to confess the truth concerning themselves, the truth concerning where they actually are in relation to him now. His invitation is to acknowledge the simple truth that they have sinned and that they have fallen. And I, I, I was struck by the fact that as I looked at Genesis 3 again and verse 10, that uh, this acknowledgement, and we'll go on to talk about it in a second or two that Adam gives, was in response to hearing God's voice. Adam said, I heard your voice. You know, friends, this morning there is no voice more important to listen to than that of God. We try to shut it out, especially when it says to us uncomfortable things, don't we? The writer of the Hebrews said in Hebrews 3.15, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And that's precisely, precisely what many people do. And many of us who are the Lord's this morning can remember how he did that precisely for many years. Oh, we, we sat under the sound of the gospel declared with no uncertain sound in our hearing. And we knew God was speaking to us and the Spirit of God was striving with us. But what did we do? We tried to dismiss it. We tried to put it away, push it away, think about anything and everything else. You know, there are people that do that in gospel services to this present day. I still see in my mind's eye a young man and woman sitting at the back of my church in, in Ireland. Neither of them were saved, but they've been brought in Christian homes. And one night I felt compelled to give an invitation. The young man turned to his then girlfriend who was to become his wife and he said, Lovely, I heard this later because his aunt was sitting behind him and heard the conversation. And she turned and she says, No, we won't. To this day they're not saved. That's nearly 40 years ago. It was this hardening of the heart. God speaking. A man refusing. I called, says God, and you refused. I stretched out my hands and no man regarded. Hear his voice. Listen to his voice because you know what you're going to discover? That his voice, though he may begin by saying to you that which is painful to hear, you're lost, you're in danger, you cannot help nor save yourself, but that's not all he will say, because he will speak words of grace and peace if you open up to him and listen to his voice. That's why in Isaiah chapter 55 again, to quote from that great gospel chapter, he says, incline your ear, incline your ear and come to me, hear and your soul shall live. And so Adam says, I, I, I heard your voice. And as he, as, he, as he responds now to the investigatory question of his God, where are you? He acknowledges his fear. First time in the Bible that fear is mentioned. I was afraid. What is 
What is it that creates the terror of God? Why is it that men seek, if it were possible, to run from God? Because they're absolutely terrified of God. And they're terrified of God because they know they have offended God. And so they do what old Jonah tried to do, although we ought to know better. They tried to flee from the presence of the Lord. And can't you see that old picture? What an absurdity it was. The futility of it all, as well as the foolishness of it all, trying to conceal themselves from the eyes of the one who sees everything, who has eyes like a flame of fire and sees not only the externals but even into the depths of the soul, who understands our thoughts afar off, who is acquainted with all of our ways. And because they are fearful of God, they try to flee from God. And again, we repeat what we have just said. What do they flee to? Anything. No matter what it is. Anything that will distract them from having to think about their position before this God against whom they have sinned and before whom they will have to stand one day. There are many and they're spending their lives fleeing or trying to flee from God. But God goes after them. Uh, a uh, uh, A.W. Tozer, a great uh, favorite writer of mine, wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. And he was emphasizing, of course, for believers how, how important and how blessed it is to, to seek the Lord with all of our hearts. But he wrote a, a parallel book to that called God's Pursuit of Man. That's what we're seeing here in Genesis 3. God is, is pursuing after him. He's asking the question. He's, he's extracted from out of the confession of his fear and of his flight from the presence of God. But God presses the issue even further with him and he takes him from, from what? The what being your fear and your flight to the why. Why is it that you're afraid? Why is it that you are trying to hide from my presence among the trees of the garden? And he asks him bluntly the question, Have you eaten of the tree that I have commanded you? You should not eat of it. Because you see, Adam, behind your fear and behind your flight is the fact that you have fallen. The fact that you have disobeyed. But you see how what God is doing here, he's He's extracting from his fallen creature the, the acknowledgement. He's, he's inviting him to confess, to admit, to own up, or as we would say, to fess up to it. And God does this still. The great work of the Holy Spirit of God in conviction is to bring a man or a woman to the acknowledgement, to the admission, to the confession. That it is even so with them as God says it is. Because that word confess literally means to say the same thing. What we're doing is we're saying the same thing as God says. We're saying, God, you're right. You say I've fallen. You say I've rebelled. You say I've sinned. Lord, that's true. I have. My conscience bears witness by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word. It's interesting that when the Lord wrote through his prophet Jeremiah chapter 3 and in chapter 3 and verse 5 God makes this statement of the people to whom Jeremiah is inspired to write. He says, I was stunned when I read these words. He says, you have done all the evil that you could. What a statement. You have done all the evil that you could. Here are people to use the words of St. Paul, who have sold themselves to sin, who have pursued iniquity with greediness. And yet in that very same chapter, and to those very same people, he says this, only acknowledge your iniquity. Only acknowledge your iniquity. Why? Because... As Solomon tells us in the book of Proverbs, whoever conceals his sin will not prosper, but the one who confesses, there it is. The one who confesses 
and renounces them, finds mercy. Have you ever, my friend, this morning simply acknowledged in the presence of God, I have sinned against the Lord. God invites your confession. He invites an honest response to which, after all, is only the truth, is it not? Is there anyone who can honestly look into the scriptures and see the requirements of a holy and righteous and just God as laid out in his law and say, oh, it didn't apply to me, I haven't got good things. There's not a righteous man upon the earth who doeth good and sinneth not, Solomon said. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, that work of conviction which the Holy Spirit of God has been sent into the world to effect in the souls of men and women through the word of the gospel. As we said last week, conviction is the legal term. It's used in the court when the jury reaches the verdict that the person is guilty as charged. They're convicted. And the Holy Spirit of God brings conviction to our souls. He makes us aware of the truth that we are guilty. Whatsoever things the law says, Paul writes, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. And yet, friends, this morning, while all of this, while all of this undoubtedly was painful for Adam and Eve to hear and to know, yet it was God and his grace pursuing them going after them after all. And you think about it, after they had sinned, God could have judged them immediately and entirely, but he didn't. He comes, he takes the initiative. He invites the question, he makes the investigation, causing them to consider now their current position and state since they transgressed his law, and he invites them to confess. We ask this question then, what is his intention, point four? What is the desire of God in doing all this? Why does he do it? What lies behind this work of his to bring us to the conviction in our own consciences and to the confession of our own sin before him? Well, we could put it in the words of the New Testament. Why does Jesus seek us? Why does Jesus seek us? Why does he come after us like this? Listen to his words spoken in the house of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the little twister who had enriched himself at the expense of his fellow countrymen by overcharging and swindling them. And Jesus comes to his house. You know the story of how he climbed the tree and so on and so forth. Jesus comes to his house and he says, today, the salvation come to this house for, listen, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So why does he seek? In order that he might save. You think of the shepherd going after the sheep. I don't know where it was. Down perhaps some gully and caught in thorns or whatever. And he seeks after it and he finds it and he looks at it. And you can just picture this. Oh, what a dumb animal. That's what you get for wandering off and turns and goes away. Well, he has sought it. No. He's done more than seeking it. The Bible says when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders with rejoicing and he brings it home. Oh, friends, this morning you and I were sought in order that we might be saved. Oh, the love that sought me Oh, the blood that bought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold. Wondrous grace that brought me to the fold. I refer you again to that chapter in Jeremiah chapter 3 where the Lord said only acknowledge your iniquity. If you look at the context in which that verse appears, it's Jeremiah 3.13. You can look it up afterwards. But the context in which he says that, only acknowledge your iniquity, it's in the context of a call to return unto the Lord. He says, I will not look on you in anger. Now think of that, think of how amazing this is. To people who he says, you have done all the evil that you could. But I'm asking you to do something very honest. Acknowledge it's true. 
Acknowledge your iniquity. And he says, I will not look on you in anger because I am merciful. Praise his name. Praise his name. What's the promise of 1 John 1 and 9? We know it well. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. I love that, that word all. No matter how deep the sin is. Doesn't matter how vile the transgression is. We acknowledge and we confess. And we come to this God who says, Return unto me, for I am merciful. And I will not visit you with anger. And God says, He's faithful and just to His promise. He will forgive and he will cleanse. What a God he is. Friends, this, isn't this back to what we see so often? That the message of Christianity is grace. This marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. That he doesn't fly to us with a flaming sword as we deserve. But he flies to us with arms outstretched in mercy and says, come to me. And I'll give you rest. And I'll give you pardon. And I'll give you forgiveness. And I'll give you cleansing. Why? Because the God in whom we believe and whom we preach is in the words of St. Peter in his second letter, the God who is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The God who declares his will through the words of St. Paul in his first letter of Timothy where it says very clearly, he says, he desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This God who swears by himself that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil way and live, and who calls out, with a heart of intense desire and sincerity, turn you, turn you from your evil way, for why will you die? Which brings me to the last thought. Implementation. God actually saves the sinner. And he does all that is necessary for that salvation to be brought to the sinner. We come to the last part of the chapter and sometimes I think that we don't spend as much time upon it as we should. Certainly uh, this is uh, a, an important, a vital and indispensable chapter in understanding the Bible and understanding our own hearts and understanding the, word, the world. But when we come towards the end of the chapter and look specifically at verse 21. It says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. Garments of skin. What a picture. How to get the garments of skin? An animal had to be slaughtered. Blood had to be shed. Do we not see even here the picture? Of that which we have seen already pictured in the sacrifices and the offerings of the Old Testament scripture. A death taking place, a sacrifice being made, a substitute being offered. The book of Hebrews makes it very clear to us that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, but they were but pictures and shadows of more precious blood that was to be shed one day on a place called Calvary, on a greater sacrifice, a sacrifice that will end all sacrifices was to be made, and not by the blood of a slaughtered beast, but by the blood of the Lamb of God, who stood in the sinner's place, who took upon himself and his body and soul the condemnation and the judgment that you and I as sinners deserve. And that by the shedding of that redeeming precious blood he would make atonement for our sins and satisfy the requirements of divine law and silence the demands of divine justice by fulfilling all its claims in himself 
And doing it so perfectly and completely that he could cry from his agony, it is finished. It is finished. Send Bob a hymn this week. We're going to sing it hopefully in the future. Written by Charles Wesley. It is finished. The Messiah dies. Cut off for sins but not his own. Accomplishes the sacrifice. The great redeeming work is done. Tis finished, all the debt is paid. Justice demand, divine is satisfied. The grand atonement has been made. God for a guilty world has died. There's the gospel. And it's pictured right here. The slaughtered animal at the gates of Eden. And notice, there was not only the sacrifice, but there was the clothing. The Lord God, it says, made them coats of skin, and he clothed them. He clothed them. Oh, they had attempted, had they not, to clothe themselves with fig leaves sewn together. Aprons, or as the old the breeches Bible, as it was called, way back in the 16th century, they made themselves breeches with fig leaves, of all things. How effective was that going to be? But the Lord made them coats of skin, and he clothed them. And isn't there a picture here of how God clothes us? Isaiah chapter 61, He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You see the two things together? The sacrifice of Christ in the slaughtered animal. The righteousness of Christ. The clothing that God puts upon the sinner. What is the righteousness of Christ? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, it says, By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Righteousness is his perfect fulfillment of the law. His perfect uh, carrying out of every demand, of every precept, of every requirement of the law of God. That's the righteousness of Christ. And when a person is in Christ, not only are they cleansed by the atoning blood, but they are clothed by the perfect righteousness of God's Son. And they can stand in Him, unafraid of the requirements of the law, unafraid of condemnation, because their condemnation fell on Jesus. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right at the gates of Eden, the gospel here is portrayed. And so that they would know there is not only a picture, but there is a promise. The first gospel promise in the entire Bible, Genesis 3.15, and it's spoken to the serpent of all creatures. And it says this, the seed of the woman will bruise your head. The word bruise is, can be translated, will crush your head. And you will bruise his heel, you will crush his heel. Our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary crushed the serpent's head. He destroyed principalities and powers, Paul writes to the Colossians, and he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in his death. This, this is what's pictured. This is what's pictured in the, the slaughtered animal whose skin would clothe our first parents. Jesus, by his death and blood and righteousness, would atone for the sinner, blood to atone, and clothing to adorn. And then you notice, and this is my final thought, God did it all. God did it all. They made no contribution to it whatsoever. The Lord God made the coats of skin. The Lord God clothed them. And all they did was to receive freely his wonderful, pardoning, saving. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Praise his name. Amen. Amen.